This video will explain how semiconductors work in basic electronics. There was a time in electronics when vacuum tubes like these worked everything, but semiconductors have essentially replaced vacuum tubes in almost every aspect of electronics. We're going to start understanding semiconductors by starting with silicon. Semiconductors are really a class of elements. Elements are either conductors or insulators from an electrical point of view. But semiconductors have the unique property of sometimes being good at conducting electricity and sometimes not. But to uh, use it for electronics, it has to be extracted from the dirt, purified, and made into silicon wafers. All semiconductors that power every computer, all of our chips, all of the modern electronics that we have, we owe to silicon semiconductors. This is a picture uh, of a plain chunk of silicon. This is a picture of a silicon wafer with uh, computer chips that have been uh, constructed on the silicon wafer. This is a memory chip and also magnified closer in. You can see individual the silicon wafers in these chips. This is a photo of a PIC chip and more magnified showing the, the little tiny silicon material inside with wires connecting it to the leads. Let's start by trying to understand silicon as a material, as an element. Uh, some elements can be classified as non-conductors or insulators, and other elements are conductors like metals. But silicon is in a group of semiconductors that sometimes conduct electricity well and sometimes don't. And to really understand it, you have to understand how the electrons are arranged around the silicon atom. Remember, the nucleus of an atom is in the center, surrounded by electrons. Uh, silicon and other semiconductors have four outermost electrons called valence electrons or outer layer electrons. But like all atoms in, in our universe, they want eight electrons in the outer layer if it's a large atom. Silicon wants eight electrons. It's most stable with eight, uh, but it only has four. So what silicon atoms do to stabilize themselves is to try to share electrons with other atoms so that they can get eight electrons in their outer layer. They combine together to form crystals of silicon, all sharing at electrons with each other. Pure silicon crystals really are not good electrical conductors. They're actually insulators. So this diagram is trying to show, if you look at any individual silicon atom, say this one here, it has four outer electrons, but it's sharing with four or with four of its neighbors. So it's got four of its own plus four that is sharing. So this, this atom now is more stable. And if you look at the, that's the case with every silicon atom in this matrix, in this crystal. Now doping is what allows silicon to become a semiconductor. Doping means adding some other kinds of atoms to the silicon crystal matrix. Often uh, phosphorus and arsenic are used. Uh, they each have five outer electrons. Aluminum and gallium have three outer electrons. Doping makes the crystal able to conduct electricity. So for example, we're showing arsenic atoms have five outer electrons. So there's not a place for this extra electron to be shared with the other silicon atoms. If we use aluminum instead, aluminum only has three outer layer electrons. So for example, this aluminum has three electrons. It's unable to share with this silicon. It's uh, missing. It would like to have another electron, say right there, but it's missing one. So we're going to represent that with this little circle to represent what uh, physicists call holes. They're not a, really a hole in the atom. It's just a space where an electron could be available, but it doesn't have one. It's lacking that electron. So holes are missing electrons, basically. So physicists and engineers refer to these materials as N-type. N stands for negative because electrons have a negative charge. It's uh, any semiconductor with extra negative charges or extra electrons. They name an N-type material. A P-type material has fewer electrons, or we could consider it as having extra holes, missing negative charges. So it's actually more positive, so P for positive. Well, what happens when we place a P-type material and an N-type material next to each other? So imagine here's what we have. And when we place them next to each other at the interface or the boundary, atoms that have the extra electrons, those electrons can move to the atoms that are missing electrons and fill up those holes. So electrons from arsenic atoms in the n-type material might be attracted to holes in the aluminum atoms in the p-type material. So the electrons from the n-type move to the holes in the p-type. And that creates 
ions. Ions are just atoms that have lost or gained electrons. When they lose an electron, they now have more protons in the nucleus that are positively charged, fewer electrons. So overall, that atom would have a positive charge. Meanwhile, the electrons that traveled to other atoms, those atoms now have an extra electron, one more electron than they have protons, so they are negatively charged ions. So if we have an n-type and a p-type material that we put next to each other, the electrons will travel from atoms nearby into the spaces or holes for those electrons in, in nearby atoms, leaving behind ions. This ionized area is called a depletion zone. It's harder and harder to get the depletion zone wider because electrons in the n-type material get repelled by the negatively charged aluminum ions. So imagine that the electrons, the extra electrons or the extra holes are trying to move through that material. As they try to move, they get repelled by those positive or negative charges because similar charges repel just as opposite charges attract. So the depletion zone becomes stabilized as soon as those n-type and p-type materials touch. Now we will discuss the first type of electronic component built out of this n-type and p-type material, and that's a diode. So what happens when a voltage source is applied to the two ends of the diode? Electrons would be pushed from the negative supply into the N side of the diode. Holes would be pushed from the P side of the diode into the positive side of the supply. The positive pushes extra holes in, the negative pushes extra electrons in. You could think of the holes as electrons being drained from that side. As more and more charges build up, you can see the, the force because of electrostatic repulsion between those similar charges. Those electrons are trying to repel each other. So the force becomes stronger and stronger to push electrons through that depletion zone. So as electrons start to move through the depletion zone, they're attracted to those positive holes. And if, if the positive charge is strong enough, it'll pull the, those electrons all the way through, creating an electric current. So current flows as electrons flow from the n-type through the holes of the p-type and out to the positive source. So to cross the depletion zone, you have to apply enough voltage or enough pressure or push to get the electrons past that ionized depletion zone. And we call that forward biasing the diode. And the forward bias voltage for a silicon diode is about 600 or 700 millivolts, 0.6 or 0.7 volts. And for germanium diodes, it's around 300 millivolts. Well, what happens if you reverse the polarity? The depletion zone widens out. And that's because the electrons are attracted to the positive, the holes attracted to the negative. It widens out that depletion zone, leaving behind the ions and widening out that depletion zone. So when diodes are reversed biased, the depletion zone gets wider. So that becomes harder and harder for charges to cross that depletion zone. The voltage would have to be much higher to push them across that zone. But if you get a high enough voltage, it will force the charges to move across that depletion zone. But heat from that large reverse current would destroy the diode. And we call that the breakdown voltage, a voltage level that causes the diode to conduct when it's reversed biased. This graph shows forward bias voltage versus the forward current, and then the reverse bias voltage and the reverse current. But notice the axes are, are scaled differently. The forward is measured in, in volts, or showing it at about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volts. Uh, the diode starts to conduct quite, a, quite easily. But in the reverse mode, we can get clear down to you know, 30, 35 volts before it starts to conduct current. And notice, even then, the current is measuring in microamps instead of milliamps. But once you get a high enough reverse voltage, current will conduct through that diode, but it'll be broken. Here's the same information on a all scaled the same. So diodes are built to act as switches. One of their functions is to conduct electricity very easily in one direction, but not allow it to conduct backwards. Because when they're for, forward biased, diodes act as a short, a very low resistance. When they're reverse biased, they act as an open, a very large impedance or resistance. So to test the diodes, you can hook a multimeter up with a positive lead to the anode and the negative lead to the cathode. 
and it should show a very low resistance. If you connect it backwards with the positive lead to the cathode and the negative lead to the anode, it should show a very high resistance if the diode is still good. Now to help you remember anode and cathode, anode is the, the end that the current flows into, and the cathode is the end the current flows out of. When semiconductor materials and diodes were first being developed for electronics, the researchers were thinking of the flow of electrons, which is what really happens. However, in electronics, for a hundred years, things have been labeled with conventional flow, considering current flowing from positive to negative. So diodes are labeled that way and should be connected in a circuit using conventional flow. So I always think of it like this, the, the label, the schematic symbol of a diode, if you complete that triangle into a letter A, it tells you that that end is the anode, and that's positive. And the negative side, the cathode, has the flat line, which if you look at a flat line, it can look like a negative sign. So anode is positive, cathode negative. There are several different types of diodes. Rectifier diodes are used to convert AC to DC. They typically handle higher power. They typically have what's called a forward current of, say, 1 amp so they can handle a fairly high current. PIV stands for peak inverse voltage, and that's the, again, the, the voltage at which they break down and start re conducting in a reverse biased mode. But the peak inverse voltage can be fairly high, up to you know, 100 volts before they'll start uh, conducting backwards, in other words, before they break. Signal diodes or switching diodes are smaller. Uh, they have a fa faster response at high frequencies. So for digital work, or conducting on the on cycle and not conducting on the on the off. Switching diodes are a, a better choice for that. Now Zener diodes are a particular kind of diode that's built to actually conduct in the reverse biased mode without breaking. And they're built so that at a specific voltage they will start conducting. They can be used to hold a voltage steady at that particular level or to prevent conducting until that voltage is reached. Schottky diodes are uh, very fast switching diodes. They have a, a lower forward voltage drop required and so they can switch between on and off much quicker. Uh, notice the different symbols, they're all similar. Uh, Zener diode, you can kind of consider the, the symbol uh, looking sort of like a letter Z if it's facing the, the right direction. Uh, shot key like a letter S to help you remember that. And that's all. Hopefully this was helpful to teach about semiconductor materials and diodes in electronics.